Hey everybody, Derek Judd, the Cowboy Criminologist, here with Cowboy Criminology. So, interesting thing happened in my civil procedure class last week. Uh, led to a very interesting discussion, which law school seems like a good place for an interesting discussion. Uh, we we're looking over a Missouri Supreme Court case called Lavender v. Kern. It's uh, from 1946. And what was interesting about it is it left the class pretty pretty divided on what actually happened. Uh, you see, originally, the employer decided that the victim in this case had been murdered. And the family said, no, he wasn't murdered he was killed by an accident while working on the railroad. So it's very, it, it, very interesting. And the difference is, <clears throat> there's a lot of implications for an employer who's found liable for a murder uh, if there was any way it could have been prevented or negated however it comes out, but if it was something that was so unforeseeable, their level of culpability would be virtually non-existent. So in this case, the railroad had a vested interest in the court finding, or at least the jury finding, uh, that the victim in this case had been murdered. And so there's, there's one other police officer in my class, uh, a guy named Mike, and, and Mike's, a, Mike's a great guy, he's got a good head on his shoulders, been a police officer uh, roughly the same number of years that I have been, and we came to two completely different conclusions. And he said, and I quote, 1,000%, Haney, that's the victim's name, was murdered. And a lot of my classmates know that I, I host Cowboy Criminology and, uh, <clears throat> and one thing or another. Well, one of my classmates, Nicole, was like, hey, you didn't say anything in class. And I said, well, you know, I didn't want to get involved in the debate. And she was like, well, do you think he was murdered? And I said, no, absolutely not. And she's the one who suggested that this would be a good video for Cowboy Criminology. So... What I did is I went through and I did an equivocal death analysis on the case. Now, equivocal death analysis, uh, if, you, you've, if you've been following the channel for a while, you've probably heard me say it a few times. But if you haven't or you need a refresher, equivocal death analysis helps give you the statistical likelihood that a death was caused by homicide, suicide, or accident. And like I said earlier, if the, if the findings are murder, suicide, or accident, they have tremendous implications. Uh, say suicide, for example. Say you have somebody who's uh, part of the Catholic faith, a very devout practicing Catholic. Suicide is considered a mortal sin. And a lot of times in the Catholic Church, well, I, I believe most times, they will not allow somebody who's committed suicide to be buried in consecrated ground. So, from a religious standpoint, it's, it, it has significant implications. And of course, then you get into insurance and liability, and, uh, you know, if you're trying to bring a wrongful death or neg negligence action in court, I mean, it just, it just goes. 
So I went through the equivocal death analysis. And before I get to the case, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what I came up with. I came up with about an 85% likelihood that Haney, our victim in this case, was an unfortunate victim of a railroad accident. Okay. Does that mean that there's no way possible he was murdered? Absolutely not. There's about a 15% likelihood that he was. I don't see the railroad's case for murder being so uh, being so strong that it ignores anything else. Okay. Um, now, I will say that the investigation done in this, it seemed like they picked in, uh, the, the people on scene, whether it was law enforcement or the, the railroad company, appeared to do just about everything they could to cherry pick what they were or were not going to look at. And unfortunately, that, that creates a problem. When you're doing an investigation involving a death, in 2024, you always work a all deaths outside of a hospital, and even some inside of a hospital are always supposed to be considered uh, suspicious. Even a suicide, even an apparent suicide, an obvious suicide—I know they're they're called different things—are always investigated like a homicide until you can rule out the possibility of homicide. It's a really good way to make sure you don't get your teeth kicked in in court. All right, you you work it until until the evidence just doesn't support a conclusion, except for what you've what you've presented. All right, um, so this comes out of a civil pre, uh, civil procedure cases, materials, and questions, ninth edition. Uh, Richard Freer, Wendy Purdue, and Robin Efren. From Carolina Academic Press. This is the casebook that we're using for uh, for civil procedure. And Richard Freer is hilarious. When you watch him on his videos, uh, he's he's a he's a phenomenal instructor. I just wish he'd write his casebooks to be as as clear and concise as his lectures are. Uh, but be that as it may, okay. So uh, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to read this for you. The Federal Employers Liability Act permits recovery for person's injuries to an employee of a railroad engaged in interstate commerce if such injuries result in a whole or in part from negligence of any of the officers, agents, or employees of such carrier or by reason of any defect or insufficiency due to its negligence in its cars, engines, appliances, machinery, track, roadbed, works, boats, wharves, or other equipment. Seems like a pretty good statute. The petitioner, the administrator of the, the estate of L. E. Haney, brought the suit under the act against the respondent trustees of the St. Louis San Francisco Railway Company, Frisco. Uh, that's how it's going to be referred to throughout the case. And the respondent, Illinois Central Railroad Company. It was charged that Haney, while employed as a switch tender by the respondents in the switchyard to the Grand Central station in Memphis, Tennessee, was killed as a result of respondents' negligence following a trial in the circuit court of the city of St. Louis, Missouri. The jury returned a verdict in favor of petitioner and awarded damages in the amount of $30,000. Judgment was entered accordingly. On appeal, however, the Supreme Court of Missouri reversed the judgment, holding that there was no substantial evidence of negligence to support the submission of the case to the, to the jury. We granted certiorari to review the propriety of the Supreme Court's action under the circumstances of this case. Or, I'm sorry, this is a, a Supreme Court case that overruled a state Supreme Court, the Missouri Supreme Court. It was admitted that Haney was employed by the Illinois Central or a subsidiary, a subsidiary corporation thereof as a switch tender in the railroad yards near the Grand Central Station, which was owned by Illinois Central. His duties include the throwing of switches for Illinois Central as well as for the Frisco and other railroads using that station. 
For these services, services, the trustees of Frisco paid the Illinois Central two twelfths of Haney's wages. They also paid two twelfths of the wages to two other switch tenders who worked at the same switches. In addition, the trustees paid Illinois Central a dollar eighty-seven, one half for each passenger car switched into Grand Central Station, which include all the cars in the Frisco train being switched into the station at the time Haney was killed. The Illinois Central tracks run north and south directly past and into Grand Central Station, about 2,700 feet south of the station. The Frisco tracks across at right angles to the Illinois Central tracks. A westbound Frisco train wishing to use the station must stop some 250 feet or more west of this crossing and back into the station over a switch line curving east and north. The events and issue center about the switch several feet north of the main Frisco tracks at the point where the switch line branches off. The switch controls the track at this point. It was very dark on the evening of September 20, or December 21st, 1939 at about 7.30 p.m. A westbound interstate Frisco passengers train stopped on the Frisco main line, its rear some 20 or 30 feet west of the switch. Haney, in the performance of his duties, threw or opened the switch to permit the train to back into the station. The respondents claimed that Haney was then required to cross the south side of the track before the train passed the switch, and the conductor of the train testified that he saw Haney so cross. But there was also evidence that Haney's duties required him to wait at the switch north of the track until the train had cleared, closed the switch, returned to his shanty near the crossing, and changed the signals from red to green to permit trains on the Illinois Central tracks to use the crossing. The Frisco train cleared the switch, backing at, the, at a rate of 8 to 10 miles per hour, but the switch remained open and the signals still were red. Upon investigation, Haney was found north of the track near the switch, lying face down on the ground, unconscious. An ambulance was called, but he was dead upon arrival at the hospital. Haney had been struck in the back of the head, causing a fractured skull from which he died. There were no eyewitnesses to the fatal blow, although it was not clear. There is evidence that his body was extended north and south, uh, the head to the south. Apparently, he had fallen forward to the south. His face was bruised on the left side from hitting the ground. And there were marks indicating that his toes had dragged a few inches southward as he fell. His head was about five and a half feet north of the Frisco track. Estimated range uh, from two feet to 14 feet as to how far west of the switch he lay. All right. Let's stop right there. That's a pretty big difference. Uh, there, there's a huge difference between two feet and four feet and fourteen feet. So that's something that that's a factual issue. Uh, that doesn't really reflect well on on the on scene investigators. Um, that's because depending on the exact footage it completely reshapes the story, re completely reshapes what could have or what did actually happen. So that's something, to, that's something to keep in mind. The injuries to Haney's head was evidenced by a gash about two inches long from which blood flowed. The back of Haney's white cap had a corresponding black mark about an inch and a half long and an inch wide, running at an angle down toward the right of center of the back of the head. A spot of blood was later found at a point three or four feet north of the tracks. The conclusion following an autopsy was that Haney's skull was fractured by some fast-moving, small, round object. One of the examining doctors testified that the object might have been attached to a train backing at a rate of 8 to 10 miles per hour. How he'd been able to figure that out, I don't really know, but we'll pass that for a minute. But he also admitted that the fracture might have resulted from the blow of a pipe or club or similar round object in the hands of an individual. Petitioner's theory is that Haney was struck by the curled end or tip of a mail hook hanging down loosely on the outside of the mail car of the backing train. This curled end was 73 inches above the top of the rail, which was 7 inches high. The overhang of the mail car in relation to the rails was about 2 to 2 and a half feet. The evidence indicated that when the mail car swayed or moved around a curve, the mail hook might pivot, its curled end swinging out as much as 12 to 14 inches. 
The curled end could thus be swung out to a point three to three and a half feet from the rail and about 73 inches above the top of the rail. Both east and west of the switch, however, was an uneven mound of cinders and dirt rising at its highest points of 18 to 24 inches above the top of the rails. Witnesses differed as to how close the mound approached the rails, the estimates varying from 3 to 15 feet. Again, that's a, that's a huge discrepancy when you're talking about a potential homicide. But taking the figures most favorably to the petitioner, the mound extended to a point 6 to 12 inches north of the overhang, hanging side of the mail car. If the mail hook end swung out 12 to 14 inches, it would be 49 to 55 inches above the highest point of the mound. Haney was 67 and a half inches tall. If he had been standing on the mound about a foot from the side of the mail car, he could have been hit by the end of the mail hook, the exact point of contact depending upon the height of the mound at the particular point. This mound was about four inches below the top of his head or 63 and a half inches above the point where he stood on the mound, still well within the possible range of the mail hook end. The respondent's theory is that Haney was murdered. They point to the estimates that the mound was 10 to 15 feet north of the rail, making it possible for the mail hook end to reach out or reach a point of contact with Haney's head, or impossible for the mail hook to reach a point of contact with Haney's head. Photographs were placed in the record to support the claim that the ground was level north of the rail for at least 10 feet. Moreover, it appeared that the area immediately surrounding the switch was quite dark. Witnesses stated it was so dark that it was impossible to see a three-inch pipe 25 feet away. It also appeared that many hobos and tramps frequented the area at night in order to get uh, rides on freight trains. Haney carried a pistol to protect himself. The pistol was found loose under his body by those who came to his rescue. It was testified, however, that the pistol had apparently slipped out of his pocket or scabbard as he fell. Haney's clothes were not disarranged and there was no evidence of a struggle or fight. No rods, pipes, or weapons of any kind except Haney's own pistol were found near the scene. Moreover, his gold watch and diamond ring were still on him after he was struck. Six days later, his unsoiled billfold was found on a high board fence about a block from the place where Haney was struck and near the point where he had been placed in the ambulance. That language right there, kind of, depending on how you read it, could take you in one of two ways, but we'll talk about that here in just a second. It contained his social security card and other effects, but no money. His wife testified that he never carried much money, uh, not very much more than $10. Such were factors in relation to respondents' theory of murder. Finally, one of the Frisco foremen testified that he, that he arrived at the scene shortly after Haney was found injured. He later examined the fireman's side of the train very carefully and found nothing sticking out or in disorder. In explaining why he ex examined the side of the train so carefully, he stated that while he was at the scene of the accident, someone said they thought the train number 106 backing into Grand Central Station is what struck this man, and that Haney was supposed to have been struck by something protruding on the, this side of the tr on the side of the tr of this train. The foreman testified that this these statements were made by an unknown Illinois Central switchman standing near the fallen body of Haney. The foreman admitted that the switchman didn't see the accident. This testimony was admitted by the trial court over the strenuous objections of respondents' counsel that it was merely hearsay falling outside of the Ray Justi rule. Uh, Ray Justi being the, exc uh, the excited utterance, uh, something said in the moment, that's typically a, uh, an exception to, to hearsay. Uh, law enforcement officers love excited utterances when they roll up on scene and somebody, you know, says says what happened. Uh, you, especially the suspect, you know, before Miranda kicks in, it's wonderful. We love that. Doesn't happen nearly as often as it probably should. The jury was instructed that Frisco's trustees were liable if it was found that they negligently permitted a rod or other object to stand extend out from the side of the train as it backed past Haney, and that Haney was killed as the direct result of such negligence, if any. The jury was further told that the Illinois Central was liable if it was found that the company negligently maintained an unsafe and dangerous place for Haney to work, in, if, in that the ground was high and uneven and the light insufficient and inadequate, 
and that Haney was injured and killed as a direct result of the said place being unsafe and dangerous. This latter instruction as to Illinois Central did not require the jury to find that Haney was killed by something protruding from the train. Basically saying, is if you believe that the railroad was negligent in the in the work environment that they provided for Haney, the regardless of what happened, you're you're still liable. The Supreme Court, in upsetting the jury's verdict against both the Frisco trustees and the C Illinois Central, admitted that it could be inferred from the facts that Haney could have been struck by the nail hook knob if he were standing on the south side of the mound and the mail hook extended as far out as 12 to 14 inches. Uh, inches. But it held that all reasonable minds would agree that it would be mere speculation and conjecture to say that Haney was struck by the mail hook and that the plaintiff failed to make a submissible case on that question. It also ruled that there was no substantial evidence that the uneven ground and insufficient light were causes of contributing causes or were causes or contributing causes of the death of Haney. Finally, the Supreme Court held that the testimony of the foreman as to the statement made to him by the unknown switchman was inadmissible under the Ray Jesti rule, since the switchman spoke from what he had heard rather than his own knowledge. That's basically the exact definition of hearsay. We hold, however, that there was sufficient evidence of negligence on the part of both the Frisco trustees and the Illinois Central to justify the submission of the case to the jury and to require appellate courts to abide by the verdict rendered by the jury. The evidence we have already detailed demonstrates that there was evidence from which it might be inferred that the end of the mail hook struck Haney in the back of the head, an inference that the Supreme Court admitted could be drawn. That inference is not rendered unreasonably by the fact that Haney apparently fell forward toward the main Frisco track so that his head was five and a half feet north of the rail. He may well have been struck and then wandered in a daze to a point where he fell forward. Not uncommon for people who experience head trauma, blunt force trauma to the head. The testimony as to the blood marks some distance away from his head lead, lends credence to that possibility, indicating that he did not fall immediately upon being hit. When that is added to the evidence most favorable to the petitioner as to the height and swing out of the hook, the height and location of the mound, and the nature of Haney's duties, the inference that Haney was killed by the hook cannot be said to be unsupported by probative facts or to be unreasonable as to warrant taking the case from the jury. Uh, that's, that's basically what happened. Is, is Originally, the, the judge said that the, the facts were so far against it that it did, didn't need to go to a jury to be decided, but the Supreme Court actually stepped in and said, no, this is exactly what the, what the jury would need to decide. It is true that there is evidence tending to show that it was physically and mathematically impossible for the hook to strike Haney, and there are facts of which it might be reasonably inferred that Haney was murdered. But such evidence has become irrelevant upon appeal, there being a reasonable basis in the record for inferring that the hook struck Haney. The jury having made the inference, the respondents were not free to relegate the factual dispute in a reviewing court. Under these circumstances, it would be undue invasion of the jury's historic function for an appellate court to weigh on the conflicting evidence, judge the credibility of witnesses, and arrive at a conclusion opposite from, from the one reached by the jury. It is no answer to say that the jury's verdict involves speculation and conjecture. Whenever facts are in dispute, or the evidence in, is such that fair-minded men may draw different inferences, a measure of speculation and conjecture is required on the part of those whose duty it is to settle this, the dispute by choosing what seems to them to be the most reasonable inference. Only then, oh, excuse me, only when there is a complete absence of probative facts to support the conclusion reached does the reversible error appear. But whereas here there is an evidentiary basis for the jury's verdict, the jury is free to discard or believe whatever facts are inconsistent with its conclusion, and the appellate court's function is exhausted when the evidentiary basis becomes apparent. It being immaterial that the court might be might draw a contrary inference or feel that another conclusion is more reasonable. We are unable, therefore, to sanction a reversal of the jury's verdict against Frisco trustees, nor can we approve any disturbance in the verdict as to the Illinois Central. The evidence was uncontradicted that it was very dark and the place where Haney was working and surrounding ground was high and uneven. The evidence also showed that this area was entirely within the 
domination and control of Illinois Central despite the fact that the area was technically located in a public street of the city of Memphis. It was not unreasonable to conclude that these conditions constitute an unsafe and dangerous working place and that such conditions contributed in part to Haney's death, assuming that it resulted primarily from the male hook striking his head. Uh, in view of the foregoing disposition of the case, it is unnecessary to decide whether the alleged hearsay testimony was admissible under the Registi Rule. Rulings on the admin admissibility of evidence must normally be left to the sound discretion of the trial judge in actions under the Federal Employers Liability Act. But inasmuch as there is inadequate support in the record for the jury's verdict apart from the hearsay testimony, we need not determine whether that discretion was abused in this inst instance. The judge of the Supreme Court of Missouri is reversed and the case or excuse me, the judgment of the Supreme Court of Missouri is reversed and the case is remanded for whatever further proceedings may be necessary, not inconsistent with this opinion. Doesn't law school reading just sound like so much fun? Okay. So there was a there was appeals back and forth about whether the, the original verdict was correct or whether it was wrong. Now eventually they found for they found for the plaintiff reinstated the thirty thousand uh, <clears> dollars, <throat> which was which was a lot of money. But when you're when you're thinking about this, the company had the railroads had to fight so hard in order to try and get out of any type of liability because uh, an industrial or commercial accident like this would almost certainly lead to some type of oversight, some type of investigation, and it would cause them to have to spend more money to fix the issues. So they had a vested interest in that. And so I'm going to kind of take this one, one thing at a time as far as how I kind of see this this whole thing paying or playing out. So the de the description of of the railroad is a little hard to visualize, especially the way it's described in this case. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put together a uh, I'm gonna put together a illustration, a diagram. And I'm going to put that together so that y'all can kind of see what we're what we're talking about, what we're looking at, and uh, that's going to pop up a few times during the video. Uh, in fact, you've probably already seen it, but I'm just reminding myself that I need to do that. So, <clears throat> 7:30 in December, it's going to be dark. We don't need to worry about that. Now, there's some interesting things here. Haney, in the performance of his duty, threw open switches, right? Uh, Haney was then required to cross the south side of the track before the train passed the switch. And the conductor of the train testified he saw Haney cross. Okay. So, even though the train was moving slow, he still had to cross in front of it in order to make it to the other side of the switch to, to do his job. That's a standard operating procedure or policy. That's something that he has to do. Now, interestingly enough, there's a difference between policy and standard operating procedure. Policy is written down. St standard operating procedure is how that policy is put into effect. Now, every industry, every business has their has their policies, but they also have their standard operating procedure. Where entities get in trouble is that when somebody is hurt on the job, the employee is always going to say, I was following standard operating procedure. This is the way we do it every single day. The manager, the owner, who uh, the agency head, whoever it is, is going to say, no, 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 we have a policy that says this is how we do this. But on interviewing everybody else, they're like, yes, that is the policy, but no, that's not the way it's done. So standard operating procedure can oftentimes override your policy. So it's something to, it's something to be 
aware of, especially in a case like this. Um, if, if both sides were coming to me and asking me, hey, Cowboy Criminology, can you do an equivocal death analysis on this case? And I'd sit down and, of course, one of the first things I'd want to do is talk to people and learn what are the difference between policy, things that are always fall, followed to the black letter of the law, of, the, of that policy. And then I'd go, okay, now tell me how it's really done. Um, it doesn't matter if you're a cor correctional officer, police officer, one thing or another. There are standard operating procedures that are effective because they're efficient, they're time-saving, what have you. Unfortunately, there's kind of a blurry line between, uh, between when standard operating procedure becomes a, a, an unsafe shortcut. And that's, that's where problems happen. And a lot of times in corrections and law enforcement, people choosing standard operating procedure over policy are oftentimes when things go the worst. So it's, it's definitely something you want to think about. So Haney's duties required him to wait at the north side of the track until the train cleared, closed the switch, returned to his shanty, switched the signals from red to green, uh, clear the track. Now, the, the Frisco train was backing at 8 to 10 miles an hour. Switch remained open. Investigation revealed that Haney had, uh, was found lying down lying face down on the ground, unconscious. Ambulance was called, dead upon arrival to the hospital. Okay. He'd been struck in the back of the head, causing a fractured skull. There are no eyewitnesses to the fatal blow. Nobody on the train saw anybody else but Haney. The conductor only saw Haney, so nobody else. Although not clear, there is evidence that his body was extended north and south, the head to the south. Apparently, he had fallen forward to the south. His face was bruised on the left side from hitting the ground, and there were marks indicating that his toes had dragged a few inches. If you fall on uneven ground or fall with more with momentum, it's not a, it's not you're not just gonna be here and then fall over. You're going to be here, and your feet are gonna drag a little bit as you go as you go down. Um, that's that's just physics. I mean, that's that's applicable to just about everything. So I I think they tried I think the railroad tried to put a little too much emphasis on that and I don't I don't think it really paid off for him. Um <clears throat> his head was about five and a half feet north of the Frisco tracks, estimated range from two feet to fourteen feet as to how far west of the switch he laid. Okay. So that's going to be that's going to be incredibly important but when you're when you're talking about the differences in height and feet from where where he was possibly hit to where he was found one thing or another in reality a good investigator is going to go through and he's going to judge somebody Haney's height at all of those areas to try and determine where, if he was struck at all, where it could have happened. And so, like I said, this was not a very well done, well coordinated uh, investigation, but we'll, we'll keep going with that. So injury to Haney's head evidenced by a gash about two inches long from which blood flowed. The back of Haney's white cap had a corresponding black mark about an inch and a half long and an inch wide running at an angle downward to the right center of the back of the head. I'm also going to put a uh, I'm also going to put a uh, a document in here where you can where I'm going to try and diagram the injuries for you. Uh, it's going to be it, it should be it should be close, but uh, we'll we'll see. And this is where this is where I start having trouble with the idea that he was murdered. Okay, uh, start with the gash on his head. 
oftentimes, if somebody is struck on the head, it takes multiple times with a blunt instrument to to split the head to where it'll it'll bleed like that. Um, and one of the things that one of the things that I wondered about. And obviously, there's but there's not going to be any pictures. But low velocity blood spatter, low velocity blood spatter. Think about it. If you've got a cut on your on your hand, your finger, your arm, and you just let your arm hang at your side, and you just allow the blood to drop, okay, that's low velocity. Uh, you're going to see very very few. There's going to be very little motion. If, if you swing your arm at all, uh, it might have a, a little bit of a tail, but the blood itself is not moving fast, which is why it's called low velocity. Most of the time, in a, in a homicide situation where somebody is beaten on the back of the head with something like a pipe, you're going to see what's called medium velocity blood spatter. And those are going to be smaller droplets of blood and they're going to be more scattered. And there's going to be evidence of something in motion. Where the, hand, where the hand comes back, there's going to be something. And if this had to happen while Mr. Haney was operating the switch, there should still be signs of that somewhere in the dirt. Some, somewhere along that area we should be able to find medium velocity blood spatter. Whether they knew about that, whether they were looking for it, who knows. But the fact that a spot of blood was later found about three to four feet north of the tracks, the conclusion of the autopsy was Haney's skull was fractured by a small, fast moving, some fast moving small round object. All right. That would seem to be appropriate for a male hook. And I'll throw a picture up there about what a male hook on a train look like. So you can, you can take a look at that. Um, that moving, let's say a train moving 8 to 10 miles an hour. If the hook was sticking out and locked in position, or maybe the joint didn't allow it to swivel freely like it was supposed to, that seems like it would it would be more likely to have caused Mr. Haney's injuries. Um, we we talked about the the pipe and everything. Yeah, I don't know about that. Now, it the the, the heights from from the mounts to the top of the track to where the how high the male hook would have been in relation to Mr. Haney's height. Depending on where you measure is going to let's see, how can how how should I put this? Depending on on where you measure, it would it would either be possible or impossible for Haney to have been struck by the male hook. All right. <clears throat> um, so you'd have to you'd have to take into account for the sway of the train, uh, Haney's approximate location to the train when it was swaying, where he was standing, and that's the thing. There are so many there are so many unaccounted for variables that to say that he was murdered, I'm just not I'm just not able to get there at this point. I'm not saying it couldn't have happened. It could have been a blitz. It could have been one of the other switchmen. They could have gotten into an argument. An altercation ensued. And it happened. But there's no evidence to support that. And so, you know, I'm, I always try to contain my analysis to, to what I have to work with instead of what I want to work with. Uh, you know, because when you can add in fa when you can add in facts to to suit your theory, well, I mean, you know, the murderer was the second gunman on the grassy knoll. He was the one who killed John F. Kennedy. I mean, yeah, you have that you have that luxury to to take that that far, 
when you include facts that aren't there. But since those facts aren't here, we got to work a little harder. All right. So I'm going to try and I'm going to try and approximate kind of kind of where he may have been. And it would be nice uh, when when I did uh, uh, my crime scene classes and my vehicle accident classes, uh, I was always taught to do sketches on graph paper. And I'd kind of like to see, I'd kind of like to try and see how closely I could approximate that um, to kind of show the points along the tracks where it's possible that Haney could have been hit and places where he couldn't have been hit. So I'm actually going to work on that. I think that might be an interesting project if I'm able to, uh, <laughs> when I'm able to find the time. Time, time is, uh, is about the most precious commodity I have right now. Uh, respondents theory that he was murdered. We've talked a little bit about that. And we talked about places where it would have been impossible to see. We've talked about it being dark outside. Uh, hobos and tramps frequented the area. Haney carried a pistol to protect himself. The pistol was found loose under his body by those who came to, re to his rescue. All right. I'm guessing that he was probably carrying a, a small revolver, maybe a, maybe a small automatic pistol, but if I had to guess, probably a small revolver. And he probably wouldn't have had any type of real retention on there, so it's probably just something that fit loosely in a holster that he could secure to his waist with a belt. All right. If you're steady on your feet, and you're not tripping over anything, those are going to be pretty good. But if there's no re retention on that and you fall at an awkward angle, there's a good chance that pistol is coming out and it's it's going and you're going to cover on top of it. Now right here, if I'm a murderer and I've just hit somebody on the head and knocked him unconscious, presumably my my Goal is robbery. If if hobos and tramps are to be believed to be the culprits, um, I'm going to take his ring. I'm going to take his wallet. I'm going to roll him over, and I'm going to look for any other valuables. And wow, what would be more valuable to me than a gun? That is certainly a superior weapon over a pipe, isn't it? I'd think so. But. <laughs> That also lends credence, if, if you take robbery out of the motive and it was in fact murdered, that means it would almost have to be personal. So, one of Mr. Haney's co-workers? That's certainly a possibility, but I still only put that in about the 15% margin of error that he was actually murdered. Uh, I've read this case several times now, and I... I I never, I never get there, no matter how I reread this. But let's keep going. No rods, pipes, or weapons of any kind found except Haney's own pistol. Moreover, his gold watch, diamond ring, were still on him. Okay, we just talked about that. Uh, why would you murder somebody in front of witnesses? You've got the conductor who can put you there. You've got passengers who can put you there. You've got other employees who can put you there. So that doesn't that doesn't work. Now we're getting to something really interesting, and I think this is where a lot of my classmates kind of like, okay, this this was murder. I'm gonna read this to you two different ways. All right. Six days later, his unsoiled billfold was found on the high board fence about a block from the place where Haney was struck and near the point where he had been placed in the ambulance. Okay. So you can read that one of two ways. One is while it was found a block away from where the accident happened. Okay. 
The other way you could look at that is Haney was moved to a place where he could be loaded into the ambulance. His wallet fell. Somebody picked it up, set it aside, maybe put it on the roof of the ambulance, planning to take it, uh, take it with him. And it fell down. Somebody found it, picked it up, put it on the post. Okay. That right there. Hopefully that's not a, a direct quote from the police report because that is just that is horrible, horrible report writing. But one way suggests murder, another way suggests it wasn't necessarily the priority of the people who were trying to administer life saving aid to him by getting him to the hospital. Uh, the wallet was put on top of the roof of the ambulance. It was whatever it was, it was lost in the shuffle. Somebody found it, didn't know who it belonged to. And so they set it in a common place. We don't know, but I'm going with the interpretation that Haney was moved to be loaded into the ambulance and the wallet was lost. I, I don't think it's any more complicated than that. Um, social security card, yeah, and then in 1946, I don't think a social security card would be the hot commodity that it is today. Um, and he never carried much more than $10 on him. Um, again, that wouldn't be very rare for, for the time. Let's see here. Frisco Foreman, after Haney was found injured. He, oh, okay, so this is a foreman for the railroad. This is interesting. He later examined the fireman's side of the train very carefully and found nothing sticking out or in disorder. Well, if it hit Haney and collapsed in, you wouldn't have found anything. In explaining why he examined that side of the train so carefully, he stated that while he was at the scene of the accident, someone said they thought the number 106 backing into the Grand is what struck the man and that Haney was supposed to have been struck by something protruding of the side of the train. The foreman testified that the statements were made by an unknown yeah, we've gone through that. The foreman admitted that the switchman didn't see the accident. Right, right, right. Okay. If you have somebody who's been hit by a hook, and I think it'd be pretty unlikely that there, there would be blood on there. Now, today, uh, odds are we could have we could have pulled fibers from his from his cap. We could have pulled uh, hair tissue and blood samples off of the, off of the hook. Maybe there was blood. We don't, we don't really know. But the fact that the foreman is the one who did the investigation and everybody just went, oh, okay, thanks for your help. Um, that just seems weird to me. That, that just strikes me as being odd that everybody just accepted the word of somebody who would have a vested interest in this being murder and not an accident caused by the railroad. All right. Uh, so, so we're going, we're going over all of these things. And when you're, when you're, when you're looking at the evidence and you're looking at everything as a whole, I just don't get to murder. I don't, I don't see it as plausible possible absolutely but not not plausible i think i think it's so much easier to believe that he was struck in the head he was dazed he was disoriented he tried to stumble across the uneven ground possibly to get back to his shanty where he could get help or find another switchman or somebody who could help him and he just ended up collapsing I think that's far, far, far more likely. <coughs> okay, so the last thing I'm going to say is kind of a restatement of, of what I said originally, is that who has the vested interest in this being murdered? Now, you could go a couple different ways with this. Um, the... The Haney's estate wouldn't want it to be murder because they would get a higher payout from the railroad if it was an accident. Absolutely true. The railroad wants it to be murder 
because then there's no reason to look into an unsafe work environment, negligence on their part, violations of policy and procedures that caused an accident under this act. Okay. The problem is, and I, I do speak with some authority on this, no family ever wants to believe that somebody, that a, that a close family member could be murdered. We don't, we don't want to go there. We don't want to think about those type of things. We always want it to be something else because we can accept an accident because accidents happen. Accidents give us closure because we can always hold somebody accountable for an accident. Even if it's the, even if it's the fault uh, of the individual, we can still say, hey, you know, it was an accident and we can, we can move on from there. No family member is going to want a case like this to be murdered. The opposite side of that is if you look at who had the most to gain from this being labeled a murder, it's the railroads. The railroads had everything, every reason in the world to want Mr. Haney's death to be a murder and not an accident. Because whether they were negligent, what, what, regardless of the circumstances, it was their equipment on their property with their employee, they're responsible. So they had a vested interest in trying to make that go away. So, y'all, that was just kind of a cool thing that came up. And Nicole, thank you so much uh, for, for suggesting it. It was, it was kind of cool to sit here and kind of go through it. But so many points kind of go towards, go more towards accident. And as far as, as far as the murder, y'all, you know, like I said, I just, I don't get there. There's a few things that I can, that I can give, um, but just putting pen to paper and trying to figure this, this whole thing out. I think Occam's razor takes over and it is far more likely that Mr. Haney was the victim of a workplace accident, whether just accident or negligence on the part of the railroad, it wasn't murder. Y'all, that's a that's an equivocal death analysis in a in a nutshell, and that's kind of a cool way uh, to practice. If you find a case like that where one side is saying murder, one side is saying accident, you just kind of break down those steps. Um, I'd love to tell you that there is a how-to manual. That makes it, you know, you just check these little boxes, but you got to take each case on its own merits. It, every case is going to be different. It's going to be unique. It's going to give you um, different facts, different points of views, different details that you have to take into account. But if you're interested, um, Roy Hazelwood wrote a wonderful book that discusses uh, that discusses equivocal death analysis in it, and I will I will post a link to that to that book if you're interested. And of course, speaking of books, um, Monsters Have Always Walked Among Us. Uh, you can get your copy on sale right now at at Amazon. Uh, uh, Y'all, if you if you bought the book, uh, do me a favor and leave a leave a review on Amazon. Uh, as an independent author. Really, it's it's difficult to promote your book, especially when you know you in a program that basically takes up two full time jobs. But if you would uh, if you'd help me promote that book, I'd greatly appreciate it, y'all. I'm Derek Judd, the Cowboy Criminologist here for Cowboy Criminology. Y'all have a wonderful, wonderful week, and I'll talk to you again soon. Take care.